Hello, I'm Joy McKnight, Managing Editor of The Banker, and I'm joined by Editor Brian Kaplan to look back on 50 years of The Banker's Top 1000 World Bank's rankings. Brian, thanks very much for joining me today. You're welcome. Obviously, 50 years is a very long time. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, the year that the ranking started, which was 1970? Who was topping the charts at that point? So whilst we're in the midst of a sort of huge period of change in banking at the moment, if you look back through the decades, actually it's always been that case. And you've always seen banks coming and going, both in terms of nationality of banks and obviously in terms of the kinds of banking activities that have come to the fore, so capital markets or transaction banking. But if you go back to the 1970 ranking, and this was based on assets, not on tier one capital as we do it now, and it was based on a universe of 300, not the 1,000 that we started uh, from 1990. It's very much an American list. So we have Bank of America at, at the top, with just uh, 25 billion in assets. Um, and you've got uh, American Bank second is First National City, which became Citibank later. Chase Manhattan's in third. Uh, fourth is the UK's Barclays Bank. Uh, then you've got Manufacturers Hanover, JP Morgan, NatWest, Western Bank Corp, BNL of Italy, and Chemical New York. Now, a lot of those banks have obviously disappeared. So Manufacturers and Chemical were absorbed into each other. Uh, and then they joined Chase and that joined J.P. Morgan. So there's four banks there that have now moved into J.P. Morgan Chase. Western Bancor uh, became part of Wells Fargo and BNL became part of BNP Paribas. So you see that these banking giants of the day and then suddenly they move on and consolidate and become completely different uh, vehicles. Now let's look at the 2019 ranking. Right. Um, obviously a lot has happened in between... 1970 yeah. and uh, 2019, especially the financial crisis. What did the top 1,000 look like last year in terms of the top banks? Between 1970 and 2019, you've had Europeans rise up, you had the rise of the Japanese, you've had more global lists. But in 2019, it's very much a Chinese-dominated list. So the four top banks in 2019 are the four big state-owned banks of China, ICBC, China Construction Bank, Agriculture Bank of China and Bank of China. Then you come to the big American banks, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo and Citigroup. Then you've got HSBC and you, of the UK, obviously, and then Mitsubishi UFJ. So the really interesting question now is, given that we've had these rises and falls mm. of nationalities of banks, can we expect the Chinese banks to be as dominant in five or ten years' time? And it's a very interesting question. Um, I think that the slowdown in the Chinese economy will lead over a period of time to some sort of consolidation in Chinese banking. Mm. I mean, they also have a lot of challenges because they've got asset quality problems. You know, they've got a, had a property bubble. They've got a sort of shadow banking system. I mean, they've got a lot, a lot of challenges, and they've got the biggest tech challenge of all because they've got um, Alipay and Tencent and these kinds of people uh, heading up for them. So I think, you know, we will see changes in the banking scene and we may move on to banks uh, from other parts of the world, being up in the top ten, Brazil or India or, you know, one of the big emerging markets. Well, let's talk about profitability. Obviously, uh, there was a big challenge when it came to the global financial crisis. Can you sort of chart that from 2008 through to 2019 in terms of profitability? Yeah, so in, in the Banker database, you know, we've got a whole bunch of rankings uh, and data that track very much what happened in the financial crisis. So if you look at, obviously, the tier one capital has really had a sort of straight line yeah. upwards. Assets is much more flat, i.e. you've got much more capital against the, the same kind of asset base that you had before the crisis. Profitability and return on capital is particularly interesting because the return on capital table shows you at a level about 20% in 2008 before the, the crisis hit, or at least before it shows up in our mm. rankings, which is extremely high. And, of course, some banks were outperforming even that. So in some ways that should have been a warning to the regulator. Why is this industry so profitable? These are kind of super profits. Mm. Shouldn't we be looking at what's going on? But anyway, that's all ancient history. Then you see a massive fall away when you come down to just a few percent as the crisis hit, and then you see it start ticking back up. But you've only really got to about 13% in return on uh, capital. But obviously it's uh, dispersed around the, 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 the world. So mm. in Europe you're looking at much more single digits, at about 8%. 8% is probably not enough to pay for your cost of capital. Mm. So there are real profitability problems for the banks now, especially in the current environment where you've got these low interest rates, you've still got legacy systems, high costs, the, the, the sort of challenge of digital. 
So uh, it, it does show very much that uh, banking these days depends quite a lot on geography. Coming to that, where are the profits being made or where are they being realised? And again, how has that changed over, let's say, the past decade or more? Comparing the big regions, Asia, Europe and the US, from 2006, which is a date obviously clearly ahead of the crisis, mm. uh, and 2019, obviously a decade afterwards. And what it shows really is that Asia and Europe have swapped positions in terms of their percentage share of the global profits. So Asia used to have 20% in 2006, now it's got 42% in 2019. Europe's gone almost exactly the other way, had 43%, now it's down to 21%. Um, so you can see that, you know, Europe's uh, crisis has actually been, in, in percentage terms, Asia's gain. Mm. North America, on the other hand, has stayed constant at 27%. And I think that's partly a function of how much better they were at dealing with the crisis in their banks uh, than Europe was. So they were very quick to force the banks to recognise their bad loans, get them off the balance sheet, recapitalise and move on. Whereas in Europe, it was much more a case of sort of, you know, wait and see, wait and see, wait and see, hope for the best. Um, and now you're into a negative interest rate mm. environment, which is really very challenging for the banks. Thank you so much for your insights, Brian. And you can get a copy of the July issue, which covers the banker's top 1,000 World Bank rankings at thebanker.com.